Hey, good morning, everyone. It's Bill here at Canaveral Court Ministry. Glad to be with you this morning. Uh, our prayer guide today is day 22. It says we are to pray for those who come to Canaveral Court Ministry or are visited on the ships to know the abundant life available to them. And that's what, that's what this ministry is about. If you don't know who Jesus is and what he's done for you, the Bible says he came to give you life and life more abundantly. More than what you're experiencing now. A lot more than what you're experiencing now. So, so believers, join me in praying for those who do not know him yet. Heavenly Father, we do pray for all those who will come into these doors when the ships are, uh, cruise ships are allowed to come back into Port Canaveral. And we pray uh, for those that are staff and team are able to visit on the cargo ships that those who do not know you yet uh, not just as their creator but as our dear heavenly father and as our friend that they may know you the one true god and jesus christ whom you have sent we pray this in jesus name amen let's sing how great our god is how great is our god Sing with me how great is our God. I will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise.
passage of Scripture this morning is Acts 25, 1 through 22. It's a lengthy passage. Bear with me as we look at the first three uh, verses. We're going to see this uh, passage is broken down in two parts. The first part is that Paul appeals to Caesar to avoid a plot against his life. So verse 1, when Felix is replaced, Paul's Jewish accusers decide to retry the case against Paul. Verse 1 says, Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. So Acts 24, I think yesterday Mark spoke about this, ended with the transition from the governorship of Felix to that of Festus. Felix was a bad dude, but history tells us Festus was a pretty good fellow. He, he governed well. He was a good governor, uh, competent uh, politician, uh, po competent leader. And, and despite all the problems left him by Felix, and they were numerous, Festus did a pretty good job, history tells us. And, and so only three days had passed that, that uh, he went from Caesarea down to Jerusalem, and that, and, and that kind of hints at how energetic he was uh, going to Jerusalem, which was the, the most important city of the province. Only been on the job three days. He's a go-getter. He's ready to get after it. And, and so he meets with the high priest and the, and the, the chief people of the Jews there, and, and they inform him of their grievance against Paul. And though it had been two years since Paul had been kept with uh, Felix in Caesarea, Paul was never far from the thoughts of these men. Uh, they, he was still an important antagonist, an enemy to them. And so they wanted to make Paul come to Jerusalem and appear again before them. And what we see here is we see that the two years in Caesarea of Paul's imprisonment, although imprisonment looks like a bad thing, we see the Lord working all things out for Paul's good and for his glory. It was actually protective custody against the murderous intentions of these religious leaders that Paul was in Caesarea in prison for two years. Not only that, Paul had went three times on missionary journeys. And since the last missionary journey, his life had been yo-yo, threatened, he'd been struck, he'd been beat. And now he has two years to rest up. And so he, he's had a, a two-year time of refreshment even while in jail. But that season of his life is over and life is getting ready for its next act. So they requested Festus to transfer Paul. They knew that Paul would be acquitted in any fair trial. They didn't want Paul to be put on trial again. They wanted to ambush him and murder him before the trial could take place. These were religious people. And their actions show the danger of religion that's not in true contact with the one true God. If your religion makes you out to be a liar and a murderer, there's something wrong with your religion. It, 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 there's a growth of corruption among these people. In Acts 23, we see the, the plot to murder Paul was first hatched by zealots. And now here in Acts 25, it's not just the zealots, it's the leaders. And they want Paul dead. Okay, well, there was a lot there in the first three verses. Let's look at uh, the next three verses where Paul refuses to put Paul on trial again in Jerusalem. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself are going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. Now, we don't know if Festus, being new on the job, knew the intentions of these Jewish leaders or not. I figure he did. I figure Felix probably 
let him in on most of the things that had gone on in the past few years. But either way, he refused to grant their request for a change of venue. And that was yet another way God protected Paul. God had greater things for Paul than these guys did. So Festus was willing to put Paul on trial again, but not in Jerusalem, in Caesarea. So then we look at the next verse. It's where the opens the trial in Caesarea. The next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews had come down from Jerusalem and stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. So here's Paul once again on trial before a Gentile ruler being accused by religious leaders. And as before, Paul's life is in danger should he be found guilty. As before, the religious leaders made their accusations without any evidence. They couldn't prove their ac accusations. And so Paul, in response to these accusations, rested confidently on both the evidence and on his integrity. You know, many times in the Bible, men of God, people of God, were targets of false accusations. Joseph and Daniel come to mind. In another sense, every follower of Jesus is a target of a false accusation by our common enemy, the devil, the accuser of the brethren. And thankfully, Jesus is our defense against condemnation and false accusation. Well, let's go on. Verse 9, Festus wishing to do the Jews a favor. Understand he's a politician. And here's another little side lesson. When you make your alliance with politicians, politicians, their job is politics, and that's a dirty game, and they play it very well. So here's the new governor, and he's seeking to curry political favors. And so he said to Paul, are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? And Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have done nothing wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. <clears throat> but if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar you will go. So the takeaway here is that though he was a good man, Festus also understood this importance to have a good relationship with the people he was governing, the Jews in Judea. And so that's why he asked Paul, are you willing to go to Jerusalem? Because Paul had riots as a Roman citizen. Festus found it difficult to decide the case. Paul standing as a Roman citizen prevented Festus from commanding the trial be moved to Jerusalem. So that's why he asked Paul. And here's another takeaway on this thing here. Is that the, the idea of riots, we as believers can use whatever rights we have by whatever government we are under to protect ourselves, but also to further the cause of Christ. And that's what Paul says. I appeal to Caesar. He saw through the plot. He knew that God was taking him toward Rome. And so he demanded, as was his right, to stand trial before Caesar. Now, he was right and wise. He wanted to avoid martyrdom if he could. He wasn't afraid of death. He wasn't afraid to face the lions. He wasn't afraid to put his mouth, his head in the lion's mouth. But if he could avoid it, he just as well soon not do it. And so his appeal makes sense. He was convinced that the evidence was on his side and that he could win a fair trial. And he also had to wonder if this new man, Festus, wasn't sympathetic 
to his accusers. So he appeals to Caesar, which was his right. And in effect, that is like in the United States appealing to the Supreme Court. Now, in your countries, I'm not sure how that works. But in the United States, the Supreme Court is the highest law of the land. And, and so appealing to Caesar was the right of a Roman citizen, every Roman citizen to do that. And so he does that. And the Caesar at the time is Nero, who later became a notorious enemy of the Christians, but not at this time. At this time, he was regarded as wise and just. And so Festus' response was, you've appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you go. That's the first part of our passage. The second part is verses 13 through 22. Verse 13. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Now Herod Agrippa II ruled a client kingdom of the Roman Empire in the northeast of Festus's province. And he was known as an expert in Jewish customs, which Festus would not have been, and in religious matters, which Festus would not have been. And so, though he didn't have any jurisdiction over Paul, his hearing of the matter would be helpful to Festus. Now, this King Agrippa has an interesting genealogy. It was his great-grandfather that killed, tried to kill the baby Jesus uh, when he was born and ordered the murder of all the infants to and under in, Jerusalem, in, in uh, Bethlehem. <clears throat> it was his grandfather, Antipas, that had John the Baptist beheaded. And his father had martyred the first apostle, John, James. And now he's the next one in line of the Herods, Herod Agrippa. And he did not rule over much territory, but he had a great influence because the emperor gave him the right to oversee the affairs of the temple in Jerusalem and the appointments of the high priest. So he is a powerful man. And Festus laid out Paul's case before him. Festus knew to his post and perhaps unfamiliar with with the Jewish traditions and customs, and he seemed to be confused by all the things that surrounded Paul. He didn't understand everything. He knew to the job. And so Agrippa's an expert, and he's going to rely on him. And so he explains to Paul in verses 14 through 22 the case involving King Agrippa. Verse 14, since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked if he could be condemned. And I told them there is not a, this is not a Roman custom to hand over anyone before they face their accusers and had an opportunity <coughs> excuse me, to defend themselves against the charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any crimes I expected. Now get this. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and a dead man named Jesus, whom Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. But Paul made his appeal to be held over to the emperor's decision. I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. And then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. And Festus replied, Tomorrow you will hear him. So the religious lead leaders were hoping that Festus would decide against Paul without giving uh, Paul a fair trial and, and, and Festus told them that's not our custom and he's explaining all this to Agrippa uh, he said they thought that he thought that they would, would bring violent ac ac accusations against him but instead it was, it was accusations about religion and about a certain Jesus whom Paul claimed was dead and now alive Did they seriously, did these religious leaders seriously think they could make Paul stop talking about Jesus? 
as believers, that's what we do. We are his witnesses. And, and, and the words that Festus used really shed a light on a lot of this. He said, a certain Jesus. It's pretty evident Festus didn't know anything about Jesus. It, it's good to remember that the great and important people of Paul's day, they didn't know anything about Jesus. They had to be told about him. That's why it's important that, that we believers keep on telling others about Jesus because he is still so little known. And guys, I've traveled all up and down the eastern seaboard and, and in places in the Midwestern part of the United States and here in Florida. And even in the United States, what I have found is there are many people who do not know who Jesus is and what he did. And so don't assume, believers, that everybody has some knowledge of Jesus. The, 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 the masses of London, Charles Spurgeon said, are as ignorant of Jesus as Festus was. The limited knowledge Festus did have regarding Paul shows that Paul's preaching was not in vain. Because Paul emphasized what we should all emphasize. That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. That he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. That he gave his life for us. So that we could spend our life eternally with him. And live eternally just as he does. By implication, Paul emphasized the cross. It's hard to believe that Festus knew that Paul preached that Jesus died without hearing about how Jesus died. Agrippa's response to Festus explaining this whole situation was this. I would like to hear that guy myself. Agrippa was curious. It meant that, that Paul would have yet another opportunity to speak about Jesus to yet another ruler. And so this would be the third such opportunity for Paul in the last three chapters or in the three chapters we've been in. Acts 24, 25, and tomorrow 26. Felix and Festus and later Agrippa. I know that's been a lot of material and went through it really fast, but, but the, uh, this is what this means for us. Believer, if you're hearing me this morning, and you are a follower of Jesus. Are you like Paul? Are you known for telling people about who Jesus is and what he did and emphasizing that he died for sins, that he was buried, that he was resurrected, and that anybody who repents and changes their minds and receives him and believes on his name can live eternally with him. That's what we are to be known for. As Christians, as little Christ, we are to be known mainly for being his witness. If you're listening to me and you're not a believer yet, are you curious like Agrippa was? Would you like to hear more? I've shared a little bit about Jesus with you. If you would like to hear more, contact us here at Canaveral Fork Ministry. Write a comment in the comment section of this Facebook post. Message us on Facebook. We would love to share with you more about who Jesus is and what he did. And we have material in your language that we can share with you, and we would love to do that. It's been great being with you this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. And may he give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next time.